Good morning, everybody. It is my pleasure to be here today. And um, I'm honored to be one of the presenters and excited to talk about the collaborative project that um, we, have, we have initiated with uh, Save the River and our partner, uh, New York State Museum. Uh, I'm assuming, John, you can hear me okay? Everybody can hear me? Um, to add a little bit to the bio that, that John had shared, um, to update it, I've actually been working for the St. Regis Mohawk tribe for 18 years now. And um, within that time frame, I've, I've transitioned into the program manager for the remediation restoration office. And with that, we work on a lot of super fun sites within the Messina area, Messina Aquazosni area of concern um, that's been identified under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Uh, we work with the Lake Ontario Management Plan and the, the relationship we have with Save the River is important because with the, the connecting channel of the St. Lawrence River, they, they provide an important piece of the, the river protection and advocacy that, that um, is that gap between Lake Ontario and where we are in the St. Lawrence River area of concern. One of the things that I've um, branched into, although we do a lot of work with uh, the different river species, mussels, lake sturgeon, uh, turtles, etc., cetera, the, um, one of my passions has been the work that we do to advocate uh, Mohawk indigenous knowledge in the St. Lawrence River also and how that translates to river decisions and management decisions on the resources. But with that, I'm going to transition into my presentation. Um, let's see here. Hopefully everybody can see it, see my shared screen. And I'm just going to stop my video so I'm not distracted with looking at my face. And today's presentation is on the investigations of the relationship between native mussels and dracenids in the St. Lawrence River tributaries, what we also refer to as Unanodid refuge. So for those um, today on the, on the um, webinar, maybe today might be your first time seeing a native mussel. A lot of times the, the public perception on mussels in the St. Lawrence River is what we know from the invasive species, the, the dress dressenids that your zebra mussels, your quagga mussels. So um, today I just wanna present a, a brief introduction to what we call native mussels or unanodid mussels. Um, they are one of um, the most imperiled fauna groups in North America. They have many threats to them, one, is um, related to habitat loss, habitat fragmentation and degradation. Just over time, over-exploitation. It used to be a huge button industry that, that um, used the pearly mussels, the freshwater mussels. And then obviously pollution is always a threat to native mussels. And what we're talking about today is invasive species and the relationship that the native mussels and the invasive species have in some of the river tributaries that we work on in the lower stretch of the St. Lawrence River. So just as a brief introduction, our project team, um, it's, it's always great to take a moment to pause and present the work, the hard work that uh, everybody does in the field and the data that you're collecting. This was a three-year project funded by New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, as John had indicated in his introduction. And our team consists of my staff at the St. Regis Mohawk Tribes Environment Division and uh, Jay Wilkins and Colby Bowman. And, and they have been integral to a lot of the field data uh, collection, the, the field support team, knowledge of the river bottoms and, and river systems um, of Sucker Brook, Brandy Brook, Grass River, St. Regis River and, and Racket River, as well as the main stem St. Lawrence, which is always important to have a good team of people that, that know the waterways when trying to set up a study design. And our, my co-PI, um, Dr. Denise Mayer, has been integral to this team and she's the director of the New York State Museum's Field Research Laboratory and her assistant, Kathleen Presti. They, they've done the majority, Dr. Denise Mayer's done the majority of the study design and the processing and, and compiling of data that's that's preliminary to date because it is a three-year grant and we began in uh, 2019 and we were able to successfully co 
complete partial year two in 2020 with some interruptions due to COVID. Um, but we look forward to um, an important year three this year in 2021. So today's presentation does just summarize some of some of the importance and the reasons why we're doing what we're doing, as well as preliminary data. Um, and Save the River has been an integral part of our advocacy and our education outreach. And with that, I just wanted to kind of give a, a, a note of appreciation to John Peach and Patricia, Lauren, Kendall, Diane, and the Education Committee from, from Save the River and Save the River Board of Directors that, that work hard on this project together. The, um, you'll probably see, I think, in the next couple of days, or if not, in some, some um, internet sharing of information, the great work that they've done um, to modify during the, the COVID year and how to do some education outreach. They've uh, summarized a bunch of the information and the importance of native mussels in the St. Lawrence River waterway and into some booklets and publications that, that should be available soon. Um, just one quick note, freshwater mussels, for those who aren't familiar, they are important because they are, are river workhorses, essentially. They filter, there are filter feeders, they bioturbate the sediment, they till the sediment, um, they provide habitat, and, and they really are critical to the aquatic system. But most people, um, when they hear about St. Lawrence River, they think of the invasive species only. But what we know about freshwater mussels in the St. Lawrence is that they have been, they were historically abundant and species rich in the St. Lawrence River and Great Lakes. But since the 1990s, with the introduction of dressenids, there has been a dramatic decline of their populations. And so we've, we've kind of turned our attention in part because of the work in, in certain tributaries and, and our awareness and knowledge. Here we are, you're looking at the map. Most people are familiar with the Clayton and, and Alexandria Bay area, maybe up to Augensburg, but the majority of the work that I'm focusing on today is down here in Messina uh, near the Moses Saunders Power Dam, just downstream of the Moses Saunders Power Dam and some of the tributaries. So for those, who aren't familiar, we're gonna be looking right here in the Grass River Racket in St. Regis and further upstream in Brandy Brook and Sucker Brook area. But what we, what we know is that there are populations of native mussels or unionotids that, that are in great species diversity and abundance in the, what we're referring to as refugia habitat in the tributaries. And so we wanted to look at that relationship between native mussels and the dracenids and in what character, characterization of river substrate is important to create this native mussel refuge habitat. And there's been some literature and a lot of research done by Dave Zanata and, and other colleagues. And some of this information comes from their publications. And when we designed our study, we, we really looked at um, you know, how they conducted their work in Lake Erie and extended into Lake Ontario and what that might mean for us and our St. Lawrence River watershed and, and connecting tributaries. So the important habitat features you wanna look for are shallow, in terms of water depth, shallow waters, less than two meters, possibly your protected bay areas, maybe around some, some islands, low flow, warmer temperatures, presence of emergent and submerged aquatic vegetation. And what we're gonna focus on today in, in, in our work is how important is the soft deep sediment and, and to ensure that the substrate is soft enough for unionotids to burrow and how much of that substrate material is silt, silty substrates. And why that's important is because when you look at the relationship of freshwater mussels and dracenids, dracenids, um, quagga mussels, zebra mussels, their life history, they can reproduce on their own. They don't need a fish host like a native mussel does. And, and they like to, to settle on hard substrates substrates even including a freshwater mussel and they become dangerous to that native mussel because they could cause 
um, suffocation, essentially. You could see in this one image here um, that they, in high densities, they make it where the muscle may not be able to open and perform its filter feeding and siphoning by having its uh, siphon exposed in the water column. So once that happens, it does present suffocation and mortality issues. And when we talk about the importance of soft silty sediment and the ability to burrow, the literature demonstrates that it's important for a mussel to be able to burrow into the soft silty sediments to possibly dislodge any of the, the uh, invasive mussels that are, that are attached on it, the zebra mussels or quagga mussels. I, I don't think there's been any research done, but I think the, the intent is that the native mussels can maybe hold their breath a little bit longer, so to say. So, so this is one of the behavior patterns that has become important and looked at in the Great Lakes and connecting tributaries to understand that relationship and, and how, how is it that freshwater mussels can clear themselves of, of the harmful effects of zebra mussels. And so that's why we're looking at some of the sediment substrates and what we know about information from the Lower Grass River. Um, when we did our study design, again, we tried to focus on what areas do we know enough about muscle composition and diversity, as well as unique habitat features. And with, with some of the work that was done, um, initially by Mark Erickson from St. Lawrence University in the 1990s and some, some investigations by Norman Doe Associates, we started to land on, you know, we know a lot about muscle composition in the Lower Grass River, but we might not know enough about muscle composition in the Racket River, St. Regis River, as well as upstream tributaries to make some sort of comparison analysis. And in 20, so, so we also have other contributing uh, research from ourselves, the tribe, the tribe, and then River Edge uh, was our partner in that work. And um, an additional work by River Edge and the Grass River in 2016, 2017 by Dr. Lee Harper. And then New York State DEC has done a significant amount in the last three years as well. And with that, we know that in the St. Lawrence River region, there could be potentially up to 23 different native mussel species. And in the Lower Grass River itself, we have, we have discovered that there's at least 16 species. And so they're important and the, the Grass River habitat's important. And the more information we learn in the Lower Grass River, the more information we can then apply it to other tributaries or, or certain bays or, or ref, refuge areas in the St. Lawrence. So just as a little bit of eye candy, I guess, if you wanna call it, um, here's, here's also just an indication of how big some of these native mussels in the lower grass river tributary can, can get um, just in terms of size by, by my hand reference. Uh, what you have in the left panel and the middle panel is a Patamalus alatus species. It's one of the most common dominant species in the lower grass river. And the, the one in the left panel is probably, I think about 25 years of age from external aging that was done. So these are also old lived uh, species. They don't reproduce quickly. And so there was, there's concern that if we're not taking measures to properly protect them, that um, the detrimental impacts from different events could you know, take decades to recover. And, and we have seen in the St. Uh, Lawrence River from the invasion of the Dracenids that it's been decades already. And how do we start looking at recovery of native mussel species in the main stem, if that's even a possibility? So the Grass River Superfund project, in terms of the importance of understanding the habitat characterization is there's a large dredging and capping project occurring over 7.2 river miles. And it, it includes about, so in the area that we're looking at the remedy footprint 
it's approximately 75% of the lower grass river is affected. And so this will change and alter the river bottom substrate from some of the areas where we know we have a lot of fine silty materials that uh, have high muscle diversity and, and composition. And if there, if placement of sand or cobbles, things like that, that might change the ability of a muscle to burrow, what does that mean for that relationship and an ability of the native muscle to be able to self-clean itself from dress ennids. And so when I talk about self-cleaning and the burrowing, it's, it's assumed that it's overwintering. I probably should have included that part in the text here is that it's overwintering burrowing. So as the water temperature drops um, in the summertime, we know with the, the dress scented, the zebra mussel life cycle that they're, they're free floating in, in concentrations in the water column. And then they settle, settle over the summer and into the early fall onto hard substrates, including freshwater mussels. And then they attach themselves. And so if over winter, when the mussels burrow deeper into the sediment, is that a mechanism that is helping to keep this coexistence of native mussels and zebra mussels in the lower grass river? Because it is pretty impressive that there's still such a high number of native mussels in the lower grass river, even though we know we have a zebra mussel influence. So on the, this little right side picture, it's just to show a couple different different species. And you could see, you could see where the mussels are. That's right where um, that sediment water interface is, and then they, they t latch on. But anything, any part of the muscle that is submerged into the substrate is clear and clean. But because native mussels filter feed, that's the part where we're concerned about with congestion of, of the zebra mussels. So the design questions to answer was, we set it up with, does existing lower grass river habitat function as a refuge for unanodids from aquatic invasive species in the St. Lawrence River environment? And if so, if the substrate in the lower grass river is suitable to function as a natural biocontrol measure for the overwinter self-cleaning, what can we learn from this system to apply elsewhere? And are there other tributaries with confluence to the St. Lawrence River that might demonstrate similar you know, not in dress scented coexistence and self cleaning behavior, or is the lower grass river unique with that, that relationship and impact? Um, and then just also looking at some of the, the differences in the remediated versus non remediated sites in the lower grass river to have a better understanding of how substrate changes might affect that, the behavior. And then based on the findings, how does that influence our restoration and management decisions? So in the component one part of our study, so our, our three-year grant was broken down also into three components. Component one and component two are driven by research design and then component three is our education and outreach component and, and that kind of integration. And the, the tributary reconnaissance basically focused on looking at two sites upstream of the Moses Saunders Dam and two sites. So the two upstream sites are Sucker Brook and Brandy Brook, and then two additional sites, the Racket River and St. Regis River downstream of the Moses Saunders Dam to see if there's any influence from the, the lock system, the, the hydro facility, water levels, things like that, and flow. We know the Snell Locks is right here by the mouth of the Grass River and we have backwater effects up the lower Grass River from the St. Lawrence because of the operation of these locks. And so that has a contributing factor on the dress ennids, the zebra mussels and guaga mussels that are in the lower reach here. And so we use those four tributaries to compare to the Grass River site. So at all five sites um, in 2019 and in 2020, uh, we, we conducted uh, plankton toes to understand what the zebra mussel villager concentrations were. The villager is just the, the free floating juvenile stage of the zebra mussels prior to them uh, transforming into a harder substrate that, that can land and, and settle with bissel threads onto a freshwater mussel. So we're basically measuring free floating um, 
zebra mussels in the water column. Uh, and so we, we did that at all five tributaries as well as a location in the main stem St. Lawrence. And you can see the sample sites based on the, the colored dots. And a 60 um, mesh zooplankton net was used to collect the villagers. And then the sample was taken back to the New York State Museum laboratory. And some of the preliminary results, I believe this data is, I just say preliminary because it's not published or, or shared elsewhere yet. It's, it's just been shared in our uh, reporting process. But the, uh, the results from 2020, you could see I highlighted that the villager concentrations support what we're finding when we when we do our surveys to look for adult mussels in the substrate as well of where the St. Regis and Racket River near the mouth are hardly affected by any of the Dracenids. There's a little bit of influence in the St. Regis, but, but none in the Racket. And then the Grass River is significantly high in the concentrations of zebra mussels, uh, villagers, and then the St. Lawrence is high as well, but um, the lower grass river is actually higher than what we see in the main stem St. Lawrence. And then Brandy Brook and Sucker Brook are on the, the order of magnitude similar to the St. Lawrence, which makes sense based on what we know about flow direction and the St. Lawrence above the Moses Saunders Dam. So this is some of the preliminary results from the water chemistry that was collected as well. Um, that it's just a standard to make sure that there's no other water chemistry impacts maybe to, to the health of the native mussels. And when we did our tributary reconnaissance with looking for adult mussels and identifying by species and counting, we um, had a standardized methodology that we used that was used similar to our 2012 and 2013 work that St. Regis Mohawk Tribe did with River Edge, where we, um, we standardized it as a one person hour search time at uh, identified transect locations. I think the transects were identified every 300 meters, but we selected representative sites in the racket in St. Regis River that were closer to the mouth to understand you know, if we could observe any native mussels, I'm sorry, any dressenids on the native mussels. And so we, the, the search time included snorkelers and scuba divers, and we counted and identified all by species. The pictures on the right are from the, I believe they're from the uh, lower Racket River. And uh, it's pretty indicative. You can see that pile of Elliptio complanata right there. And it's not unusual in the St. Regis River, Racket River and Grass River near the mouth to, to get approximately 600 individual mussels in what we refer to as a one person search hour and up to five to six different mussel species. And so it's pretty impressive, the, the diversity and abundance of mussels in the tributaries downstream of the Moses Saunders. However, upstream of the Moses Saunders, Brandy Brook and Sucker Brook, we need to go back and conduct some additional work because we, we only did preliminary work in 2019, but there were no surveys in 2020, but mostly there was on visual observation you would see more of the mussels with the adult dress scented attached and not near as many um, mussels or mussel diversity as what you find in the lower uh, downstream tributaries of the, the Moses Saunders. And there's a couple pictures here from the St. Regis River where we maybe had four individual adult mussels with maybe one or two adult zebra mussels attached to them. And then all the other transects and sites that were monitored were free and clear of zebra mussels attached to the native mussels. Nice picture of some Lampsilis cariosa, 
um, my favorite Lingumia recta to the right here, but they're clear. And that's always a good sign. That's what you want to see. That's a healthy muscle and, and it's not impacted by invasives. But in the lower grass river, this picture on the bottom right, you see that it is, I can't even tell which muscle species that is actually. Um, oh, it's an elliptio complanata because our my tag tells us right here, it's an EC. But um, it is just clogged with zebra mussels. And surprisingly, this muscle is still alive. It's still filter feeding. And so it's just curious to, to understand, you know, will this muscle on its own clear some of the invasive species from it from overwintering and burrowing? And what does that look like in the spring? And what's the age and the growth of the zebra mussels on top of this native mussel? And so that's what kind of led us to some of our component two evaluations of understanding that relationship and the self-cleaning behavior. And so the, the study design was set up so that way we had 10 sites total, all of equal distance of a five by five meter quadrant at each site. We tried to target similar habitat areas within the lower reach, closer to the confluence of the, the St. Lawrence. So that way we didn't, you know, influence the study design with any different habitat substrates or, or other. And uh, we had five non-remediated sites and five remediated sites. At each site, there was sediment samples taken to, to characterize the particle size. Uh, grain size, particle size, and then sediment plates placed at each, and three species of mussels were tagged at each quadrant. And this is just a video here to show the intent. <clears throat> I'll let the video play, and hopefully you can still hear me. And what Dr. Denise Mayer is doing here, she's, she's clearing the dress sentence from the native mussel. And all the mussels, all the dress sentences that are removed were placed on ice for transfer back to the lab, preserved in ethanol, and then they're identified, imaged, and measured to quantify, you know, some of the densities and, and that, that there's some relationships that are published out there of, you know, certain number or or mass of zebra mussels on a freshwater mussel may cause mortality. And so it's interesting that some of these mussels are still surviving and thriving, um, even though the densities of zebra mussels on them are pretty high. So after, after the, the zebra mussels are cleared from the, the freshwater mussel, um, each mussel was measured and tagged with a B tag, a unique tag. So that way in our study for year two and three and possibly future years, we can go back to that site, find the muscle. A subset of them had a uh, passive integrated transponder, what's also known as a pit tag attached. So that way we can find it underwater a little bit easier. Because once we place these back in the river, um, they don't move too far, but they do move some, and we want to make sure that for our study design, we can recapture them next spring. So some of the preliminary results of the sediment characterization, you can see a chart on the left hand, it's showing the uh, particle size of the non-remediated sample sites. Whoops and then the particle size of the remediated sample sites. And you could just see the particle size distribution varies between the non-remediated sites and the, and the remediated sites. And so we're just looking into now, like how important is that? How important is that uh, grain size variability? And in the pictures on the left, in the non-remediated sites, you can see even in coloring that it's a little bit darker. So there might be a little more uh, organics in this, the substrate itself versus on the right um, from placement of the capping material, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of sands. So this is just what the settlement plate looked like that was collected in the fall. 
You can see the very small size uh, dress enids that have attached to it. Those were also taken back to the lab, uh, counted and quantified and measured. And this is just a picture to demonstrate that if um, there was clearing of the zebra mussels from a native mussel, you will still see these, these bissel threads. And the bissel threads on a native mussel is also evidence that somehow um, there was previously dress on attached and they've been removed. Now in this case, because there's been so much work going on in the lower grass river, the, the zebra mussels may have been physically removed by a person because there's been a lot of mussel salvage and collection and relocating and in that process removal, physical removal by hand of zebra mussels in, in the lower grass river. But so our, our study design will hopefully in 2021 or 2022, as we continue to go back to these sites that we had removed the mussel, the, the zebra mussels from the native mussels, be able to look to see any new growth of zebra mussels because all the mussels have been tagged. So we'll be able to make that comparison each year. And if any of the overwintering and self-cleaning behavior has helped to dislodge the invasives. So our next steps are to complete the year three of investigations. Um, this 2021 conduct surveys in all five tributaries. And this will be our first year of seeing some of that comparison in the spring of both the overwintering, potential clearing behaviors, as well as um, the, the site comparison. And then we'll work with uh, Save the River and uh, Dr. Denise Mayer and reporting our findings and, and how some of those findings may lead to different uh, resource management decisions. And some of the management decisions that we're, we're factoring in is um, for any habitat restoration project in the Lower Grass River, how important is this soft silty substrate that's existing pre-remedy to post-remedy to make sure that, that we have sufficient habitat for mussels to, to burrow so they can um, still thrive in the system without the influence of the zebra mussels, the invasives. And then how can we use this information to transfer the knowledge to the St. Lawrence River system? You know, are there islands or coves or other shallow, shallow soft silty sediment areas in the bays that could function as this, this refuge habitat as well? And we would need to do potential, well, we would need to do future surveys in the St. Lawrence, whether it's in our region by Messina, Aquasasne, or further up upper river to understand if there's even that um, existing adult remnant populations of native mussels existing currently. There's very few surveys that have, that have looked at that in the St. Lawrence in, in our area anyway. And then um, again, the influence for the possible habitat restoration projects for native mussel population recovery in the St. Lawrence or connecting tributaries. So it'll be interesting to see how, how this um, will, will influence management decisions, not just for tributaries, but the main stem St. Lawrence as well. And I just wanted to thank uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation Invasive Species Grant for the funding and our, um, our collaborators and our partners, the New York State Museum, Save the River, and um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't include a special thanks of appreciation to the New York State DEC team of uh, David Trump and Rebecca Quayle, and Chuck Nieder, who have been supporters of this project, as well as helping to collaborate with us with their HDR dive team to assist with muscle collection and dress ended removal, which has been a huge, huge help with achieving some of our goals. And with that, I will take any questions. Uh, Jess, I'm just gonna jump in for just a second. If there's any member of the audience who um, would like to submit a question down at the bottom of your screen, there's a tab called Q&A and you can enter your questions through that. 
Um, thanks for a wonderful talk, Jessica. The first question up is, does the presence of muscles indicate river health? I would say yes. Um, you know, in terms of water quality river health, um, if there was a high source of nutrient loading or pollution, um, native mussels are very sensitive to um, mercury, aluminum, uh, well, I'm sorry, <laughs> D different agricultural runoff byproducts. And so it is, it is an indicator of, of good health. However, they do thrive in some of these polluted systems as well. And that's what we found in the lower grass river. Um, even though there was legacy contaminant influence, they, they were doing well. Thank you. Uh, the second one up is how does the new substrate affect the ability of native mussels to burrow? That is a great question. And that is some of the, the premise of our study design. And uh, we will be interested to see what the results are in the next two to three years as well. Uh, the next question up is what cooperation sharing do we have with Canadian neighbors? For, for this work in the, the tributaries downstream of the Moses Saunders, currently we don't have any cooperation, but um, our office does work with the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne, uh, but that is always a good um, expansion of the project when we can start to apply it more in the main stem St. Lawrence of working on those, those partnerships with, with Canadian entities. Uh, next question up is, are there indications from this study that it's possible for invasives and native mussels to coexist? Yes, I think even just from our observations, um, even early on, I, when I say early on, um, with some of the work that we did in 2012 and 2013 with uh, Dr. Lee Harper and, and Dr. Mark Erickson, I think there was just some initial surprise in comparison to Dr. Erickson's work in the 90s that the native mussels were still there. Um, you know, I think there were some assumptions that the dress enids would have caused high rates of mortality in the tributaries at that point in time. So, so it's still being watched, but the concern is still there. Um, but it is interesting that they are coexisting. Yeah. Uh, okay, next question up is, what's the effect on the ecosystem if native mussels are eradicated from the St. Lawrence? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, the, so the question was, what's the effect on the ecosystem if native mussels are eradicated from the St. Lawrence? Oh, well, they've, they've pretty much been eradicated, I think, from the St. Lawrence, and you're seeing some changes in the, the nutrient cycling because of the work being done by the zebra mussels and invasive species rather than the native mussels. Um, and it is causing some differences. I am unfortunately not a malencologist and I don't, don't study those changes and trends enough to be able to respond more eloquently. But um, that is a great question that maybe Dr. Denise Mayer can follow up with um, if, if there's future interest of, of having some some more information shared in an e-blast or, or some sort of mechanism that Save the River can do. Um, I've got one more question for you. Uh, and then I think the other ones we can take later and respond later. Um, but this last question is, is this study unique and what is known about other Great Lakes tributaries? That is a great question. Um, there was just, I think it's unique for our area of the St. Lawrence River watershed. I don't believe it's being done elsewhere in Canadian or US waters within the, the connecting um, St. Lawrence River channel, but there is work being done in Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. And the, um, some of the work, I'm trying to remember who the authors were, but there was just some work that was presented recently on um, how to, to model 
some of this refuge habitat in, in the Great Lakes and, and using the information that they've gained from, from these soft silty habitat areas, refuge areas in Lake Erie, and then applying it to identifying suitable locations in Lake Ontario for, for maybe having muscle, muscle refuge. So we are, we are working off from what's being done elsewhere in the Great Lakes, but I, I do believe it is unique here in the, the St. Lawrence watershed. 